My name is Molly Nance, and I'm Director of Public Relations and Communications for the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska, which we thankfully have called DWFI for short. Um, and it, the Institute's mission is to improve water and food security for our world through research, education, communication, and development. We're very pleased to provide a series of webinars this fall to share knowledge and ignite collaborations to achieve our shared mission. Creating a supportive environment for women and youth in agriculture and water leadership is important for ensuring water and food security around the globe. Water and agriculture are closely tied and the first two sessions of our webinar series will hear from women and young entrepreneurs and young leaders who are currently making an impact in this space through programs or projects and from those specifically working to empower women, advance educational opportunities, and organize programming related to agriculture and water. In this first session, we are very excited to hear from award-winning chef, entrepreneur, and agriculture advocate, Louise Mabulo, as she discusses youth and sustainable solutions to food security. Louise promotes resilient agriculture and farm-to-table cuisine and was recently awarded as a Young Champion of the Earth by the United Nations Environment Program and named by Forbes as one of 30 Under 30 Asia Social Entrepreneurs 2020. Following our discussion with Louise, there will be an interactive panel including University of Nebraska graduate students studying agriculture and effective stakeholder engagement who will share their perspectives and research areas. Welcome, Louise. We are delighted to have you join our webinar and appreciate the time you are taking from your projects to share your perspective as a young culinary and agriculture entrepreneur. Let's begin with your background. How did a young woman from the UK end up building a culinary program and sustainable agriculture project in the Philippines all well before you turned 20. Well, hi Molly, thank you so much for having me on today. I'm really excited for today's session. Now, to tell you about my journey, I'll just quickly share my screen. And it began when, it began when I was a 12 year old on this television reality show called Junior Master Chef. And I was this little munchkin and the show, well, it catapulted my career into an early culinary career. Basically in my whole teens and a lot of my younger years, I was kind of like this culinary prodigy here in the Philippines. And I was kind of the youngest member of some elite culinary organizations. And so this, this little girl right there in an oversized chef's uniform, that was me. And I was really, really young. And as a young person, like Gen Zer, millennial, kind of like right on the border of that, I felt that having a successful culinary career alone was just not enough. I'd always been passionate about ingredients and about sourcing them well and growing them yourself. Like when I was 14 years old, it was the first time that I got into agriculture because I invested in cows. Um, and from there, I learned about the magic of turning water and soil into your friends and growing them into your own food. So since then, farm-to-table cuisine had always been my platform, my advocacy, and supporting locally grown ingredients, which I served up at my place called the Culinary Lounge. Now, it wasn't until December of 2016 that I was fully immersed in agriculture and kind of thrown into it when my town was hit by Typhoon Knock 10. And this destroyed 80% of agricultural land in my town. And it was kind of then that I knew that I had to do something to rebuild livelihoods sustainably through resilient crops and responsible farming practices and support local farmers. So that effort ultimately led me to building my social venture, which is the Cacao Project. And we're rethinking our existing food systems and harnessing the power of our forests to create resilient and climate smart livelihoods to position our farmers for sustainable success. Wow, that is... Incredible, Louise. Um, and I'm looking at the picture of the I had no idea they came in so many different colors. Oh, it does. It comes in yellow, green, orange, it's a rainbow. Uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, Louise, as I'm thinking about, um, you know, your, your motivation after the typhoon hit, you know, obviously a disaster like that motivates a person to want to help. But right. most of us would donate money or share the tragedy through social media as a way 
involved. What led you to initiate an entire relief program um, at your young age? In full honesty, like when I started the Cacao Project, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like a, a social venture that I'd planned. It was a typhoon relief effort. In fact, I have the picture here when we were just starting out. It wasn't even, it was practically non-existent then. So when I started, I had to utilize social media and call out to friends and family. And we were able to raise funds to get assorted vegetable seedlings to our farmers. So we had help from the local government and we reached out to farmers who needed assistance. And they also acted as an expert resource for us at the time. And we also had the local agricultural councils to help us further on with training programs when we started looking at cocoa as a long-term resilient crop to grow. Now, I also reached into my own personal savings, kind of bootstrapping it um, when it became apparent that I had to become a social venture. And since we couldn't just ignore the issues that were happening here, we had, we couldn't like, we had a yearly typhoon. We were right in the typhoon belt, as you can see here in the Philippines. And with the climate issues, it's worsening every year. And we knew that it was a project that was in for the long haul. We had to continue protecting farmers and doing something that would support them in the long term. Wow, that is, um, that's an amazing video. I mean, that was a, you know, terribly devastating typhoon. You know, and I, I imagine it might have been difficult to get farmers to see the value in producing cocoa trees or even in joining your efforts as, as a very young woman. Um, did you run into some challenges there? Definitely. I, I, it was really difficult to start the venture at the beginning. When I first started, a lot of farmers looked at my project and they thought, why would we change now? They, were, they looked at it with a healthy dose of skepticism and they would say, why would we listen to this young girl who's suddenly telling us that there's another choice? And we initially worked with a smaller group of farmers and a lot of them were already growing cocoa trees in our area, but they weren't propagating them for commercial use. It's just kind of, they just let it grow wild. And we put them through training programs on cocoa farming and we put them through sustainable farming programs and we tried to propagate their crops for, for more harvest. And after some time, they began reaping harvests and seeing results. And not just from the crops that they newly planted with us, from the vegetable seedlings that we gave in the cocoa, but from existing crops that they were growing, they were suddenly seeing uh, a larger kind of harvest and har uh, every harvest season. And so they were applying these techniques and seeing all this growth and all these produce and other people started seeing the benefits, other farmers who were initially kind of skeptical of us and they thought, hang on, people are starting to make money out of this. So, okay, well, we'll give it a try. So at the moment, we're working with over 200 farmers and we planted over 85,000 trees over a span of 85 hectares of land. And it's, it's improved the diversity of the crops growing in our area and the soil quality improved too. Now, in fact, after Typhoon Not 10, which was the typhoon I'd mentioned earlier, since we planted so many vegetable crops, people had so many harvests from these vegetables that we had this abundance of food. And we were the only town with that abundance of food, that we were the only town with a decline in crime rates after this disaster that struck, because we were addressing a basic need, which is really food and hunger. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, but obviously success success. I can see now how other farmers would be interested in, in getting involved when they can see others being successful. Right. That's, that's great when the results speak for themselves. Well, you know, you've created this fantastic project and now we've all been hit with another global challenge um, in COVID-19. Um, you know, all of us, including our farmers, um, are dealing with this in the U.S., it had a devastating impact on the entire food system. We weren't prepared to quickly pivot from large-scale delivery to restaurants and grocery stores and cafeterias, which resulted in, you know, literally a, just a tragic amount of food waste and lost business. Um, how has quarantine and other public health measures affected you and your community and your farmers? Yeah, as, well, as you know, when the pandemic started, it triggered this like global knee-jerk reaction to change or to do something about it. And obviously we didn't act fast enough because the pandemic took away a lot of businesses and jobs. And the only important thing in these times is health, uh, food and water really. And it's kind of highlighting the need for food security. 
And now there's kind of a, I noticed in time, there was a spotlight on agriculture when people started realizing how important food was. And many industries plummeted, but until now, agriculture and food is still there. Um, at the start of quarantine, as you mentioned, we dealt with a glut of produce. It, it took a while to figure out how to move food and how to utilize food. And in my municipality, what happened was that Farmers had so much produce with the cacao project, with everything that we did, and a lot of the restaurants were shutting down, a lot of hotels shut down, so they lost suppliers. So we resorted to kind of a barter trade system here with other farmers. I said we kind of lived in a mini bubble of paradise. We had so much food. Um, but what we did do was work with the local government. So the local government here, uh, what they did was to address the food security crisis they bought food and produce from the farmers instead of canned and processed food and this was distributed to the community as relief goods since we were locked down people couldn't go to work this was kind of the 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 relief goods that they had to give so people had food every single day so not only were we maintaining farmers income but we also utilized local produce and gave it to people so they had a fresh supply of food that kept people healthy um, but now as time went on, we learned to kind of adjust and digitize and use this time to improve our approach and our communications plans and highlight the value of our food systems really to, to the audiences now that are at home. Right. So it's, I think it's a continuing evolution. You know, we're, we're continuing how to adjust, um, but that, that's just fantastic. And it's amazing to see how quickly you've made a difference, uh, helping farmers, um, communities with much needed food and improving their own livelihoods at the same time. What do you see as challenges that are preventing more young people from pursuing careers in farming or, or raising livestock? Well, I'm really glad you raised that question because um, one of the things that we're trying to address is that in countries like mine, or I don't know, in other countries as well, there's a stigma against farmers and farming is often associated to either uh, poverty, vulnerability, unsustainability, and that mindset kind of keeps people in that cycle. I mean, children here in the Philippines are taught in school that if you fail, you'll become a farmer. And so people have this idea that farming is not only associated to poverty, but it entails failure, and that's terrible. And it ties with immediate and measurable consequences in minds of children and in a nation about our food systems. So with the cacao project, one of the daunting undertakings that we're trying to execute is to deprogram this mentality from our culture and change not only the way we view food production, but the way we actually produce food so that we can break the cycle and create circular as well as regenerative and profitable ways to farm. And we want people to view food production as a noble career choice. And this task is like increasingly urgent now because every single day that goes by with the current age of farmers in the Philippines at 57 years old, we'll have an impending food security crisis in the next 15 years if we don't do something to kind of reform this industry. Understandable, yeah. Louise, do you think, you know, as a, as a female, as a woman, um, do you think it's harder for women to get into agriculture? Why, why don't we see more women involved in agriculture? I think it's because uh, I know biblically and historically, it's always considered kind of the man's role to make an income and bring it home to their families. And we'll, let's, we'll, let's have to face it. We've been conditioned this way for the longest time. And it's difficult to break the confines of this idea we've been raised to believe. But what we can do is to begin with is to remove those barriers holding women away from the industry. Since we do have a lot to offer for farming and in agriculture and in water careers, it's just, if it's something that we had to kind of put our interest in. So women are kind of, I always say this, because as a chef and a farmer, I'm in male dominated industries and they say that a woman's place is in the kitchen. But when you get into professional Michelin starred kitchens, suddenly it's this male dominated industry. But there's opportunity for us because we have different ways to showcase our grit and resilience. And it's up to us as women to prove that we can keep up to that standard and commit to this higher level that men uphold as well. And in the cacao project, just to, just to mention that, we actually have four male staff, but they're all supervised by this one lady supervisor who is not only an amazing leader, but she has great ways to train and teach and empathize with a lot of the farmers that we work with. So there's really different ways that women in agriculture can maintain their careers. And you know, there's different career options, not just in the ways that we traditionally see it. Agreed. And I'm so pleased to see, you know, the, the, um, the exposure that you're giving to both 
young people and women in the work that you do. And I'm hoping through social media and, you know, TV shows, um, if we can show more women involved in farming, you know, then you, it's a, it's like being a role model. You like to emulate what you see. So it's, it's that cool factor. It does. Um, <laughs> my next question for you is, you know, we've talked a lot about challenges, but what do you, you know, what's the other side of that coin? What do you find as um, exciting opportunities ahead in, in your future and the future for other farmers who are pursuing these kinds of projects? Well, first of all, I'm really excited that the future is holding a lot for regenerative agriculture and there's new kind of career opportunities that are happening because of, well, because of this crisis and because people are more aware of our food systems. With the cacao project in our immediate future, we're eagerly expecting our harvest in this year. And we're, we're really astounded to see that we're projected to mobilize and consolidate over 10 million pesos worth of cocoa. That's about, I think, 205,000 US dollars in the next year alone. And all of this is just from the humble beginnings of a local agricultural project in this developing country by a young person like me four years ago struggled to earn any credibility in the agricultural space on a topic like this. But now I also we also have the opportunity to be at the forefront of platforms on speaking out on topics like agricultural policy guidances and in intergovernmental platforms. And we're speaking on these related issues about environment and how we can pioneer these practices in countries like ours in a way that's accessible and, and inclusive to everyone. Because really, I mean, agripreneurship, as I call it, which is social entrepreneurship in agriculture, is so much more than like being your own boss and controlling your own time and being cool. But it's also the chance to seize the opportunity to build a world that you envision, that you can integrate environmental stewardship in our work in agriculture to inspire community action and make a global difference. Because honestly, agriculture will always be necessary. We will need farmers three times a day, every day of the week. But in small ways, we can transform this industry to be inherently sustainable so that in doing so, we're benefiting both people and planet. Well, Louise, you've definitely inspired me. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Our attendees are inspired as well. Thank you so much uh, for sharing a little bit about your background and about the programs and, and the things that, that you see that we can all do to improve sustainability and to get more people involved in agriculture. Um, I can't wait to see your progress. Thank you. <laughs> um, next, um, I want to hear from, we've got three, we have three University of Nebraska graduate students who are using their talents to accelerate agricultural production in a variety of ways. First, we'll hear from Osler Antonio Ortez Amador, who is studying agronomy, followed by Jackson Stanzel, who is studying agricultural and biological systems engineering, and Jody Delosier, a graduate research assistant in natural resource sciences with a specialization in human dimensions. First, I'll turn it over to you, Osler. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you, Molly, for the introduction, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Luis, for all your great work and efforts on moving forward agriculture and helping out community uh, back home. Uh, my name is Osler Ortez. I am a third-year PhD student at the University of Nebraska. Uh, sharing a little bit about my background, I am originally from Nicaragua. This is a small country in Central America. As I highlighted here in the slide, uh, this is a place where we rely on subsistence agriculture. Um, a few pictures there on coffee. So I have been involved in coffee production since I was a kid. And uh, this has been done for generations in my family. So this, all of this uh, uh, mix of, of things in my childhood uh, brought my interest to move forward in agriculture. Next slide, please. Okay, so I had interest in agriculture, then I was uh, motivated to go forward and I moved to Honduras, still in Central America, where I got my undergrad degree in agriculture. This was at the Pan American Agricultural School Zamorano. Um, after I finished college there, 
I was a first generation of uh, in my family getting a, up to a college degree, but I still it was a huge uh, accomplishment. But it was uh, still on my best interest to move forward and do something more. So I started to look for uh, graduate school opportunities here in the United States, and uh, in 2016 I was admitted for a master's degree in agronomy at Kansas State University. I was there for a couple of years, and uh, after I was done in Kansas, I applied to join the University of Nebraska for a doctoral degree in agronomy, and uh, this is what I am working on right now. Next slide. So a little bit about my training. Over the years, I have been, like I said, early stage coffee production. I am still um, engaged in that. So we have a family joint uh, farm back in Nicaragua that is uh, fully operated by my mom. Uh, so I am still part of that since uh, I came to the United States. Now on soybean production for my master's degree, I was able to do research on uh, soybean management practices and nutrient limitations. This uh, research was conducted in Kansas, United States, and also in Santa Fe province, Argentina, where I had the opportunity to travel and uh, work uh, with uh, some different collaborators uh, over there. And currently working in corn physiology. This is my program and research project at the University of Nebraska. We are working and trying to uh, mitigate productivity losses in corn. This uh, picture in the bottom right hand is showing some of the um, abnormalities in corn that we are trying to understand better and hopefully find answers for our stakeholders, not only in Nebraska, but also in some other regions where this has been a concern. This little map there of the United States shows uh, five red stars. Those red stars are indicating the states that have reported abnormalities that we are currently investigating. So it's not only a matter of Nebraska, but it's more like a regional concern at this level. And this is what we are um, uh, striving for. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit about my personal interests. So always research and extension has been my top priority. University of Nebraska has been fundamental for uh, making me grow and giving me opportunities of uh, moving forward on this. So working with research, working with extension, uh, getting to talk to farmers, to growers in the state and uh, meetings uh, locally, regionally, and also at the national level. But besides research and extension, also service and leadership and entrepreneurship are things that resonate quite well on my, on my on my interest and the career that I want to continue to pursue on in my future. So I wanted to wrap up my introduction with uh, what I think, in my personal opinion, some of the top general challenges and uh, big opportunities that we have towards agriculture, young people, and women involvement. So some of the main challenges I have listed here on the top left, uh, adoption of technologies. We have technologies available uh, they are being introduced, they are being developed. However, they are not, not in all cases, they will be available. For example, the smallholders in uh, Nicaragua or in the Philippines. Uh, second step, climate change. This is what brought uh, Luis interest in uh, working with cacao over there. So we know that climate change is something that we deal with here in the United States and uh, all over the places. And finally, we have also market changes and uh, consumer perceptions. Those are things, for example, what a customer wants today, it might be different tomorrow. And that is so true for our coffee operations back home. So we have been working with different varieties, different uh, quality profiles, and uh, that's a, a market that is always changing. Now, based on that, what are some of the opportunities that I can see? 
I truly believe on partnerships and collaborations and uh, inclusiveness. Uh, an example, this is my mom picture in the center there. This is our small farm in Nicaragua. Like I said before, she, she fully operates this uh, farm and some of our coffee is exported to places like the United States, Japan, Europe. And uh, she, she has done a great job and uh, we believe that she will continue to do great in, in what we are doing and growing. Also, we think on a holistic approaches. Uh, I think it's time for going outside of the box. We need to uh, start integrating uh, um, different aspects in order to uh, make progress on the decision making in our uh, uh, everyday steps. And last but not least, sustainability and um, improving efficiencies. That's something that we need to keep in mind um, in how um, anything that we do. Uh, sustainability, making sure that we are doing the right use of resources. Water is a key limitation for agriculture. So we need to make sure that we pay attention to that and that all of this comes together um, at the time when we are taking decisions and implementing actions. Um, and with that, I think I, we are ready and uh, we can turn it over to Jackson. Thanks, Oliver. It was uh, really good to hear from Luis earlier, um, you know, hearing about more about international agriculture, which is not something that I have a ton of experience with uh, and, and her journey. Um, that's been pretty incredible and inspiring. And, and Osler, I've had uh, the fortune of talking to him a few times before, and um, I think he brought up some really important context. Uh, within climate change and some of the other grand challenges that we have uh, in agriculture, both domestically and internationally. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit about my background, research and perspectives. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, that would be great. Yeah, so my journey began uh, in Dothan, Alabama, which I consider to be my hometown. Uh, it's the self-proclaimed peanut capital of the world. Uh, and so approximately 50% of the U.S. peanut crop is grown within 100 square miles of Dothan. So it's a, a very different agricultural landscape than what we have here in Nebraska. Uh, and from Dothan, I actually uh, attended Harvard uh, College uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I also played varsity football for four years. Um, and I got a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Sciences there uh, with a focus in bioenvironmental engineering. Uh, and my undergraduate thesis was focused on uh, essentially engineering hydrogels uh, as soil amendments to basically reduce nitrogen leaching. And so they were designed to capture nitrogen, uh, nitrate nitrogen within the soil. And so after completing that thesis and my undergraduate degree, I decided to come out here to the University of Nebraska, um, which is corn country, uh, and pursue a Master's of Science in agricultural and biological systems engineering. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much been my journey and I've, I've learned a lot of uh, different things in a lot of these different uh, regional contexts, um, which have I think really benefited me on the way. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So one, one big question uh, for me, you know, I, I didn't grow up on a farm um, and I essentially lived in the suburbs for the majority of my life. And so one of the big questions that I get sometimes is, is why agriculture? Why is this, you know, what you want to do and what you want to work on? Um, and for me, agriculture is such an exciting place to be. It's a dynamic environment. And, and on the left side of the screen, you can see just a few of the things that I do uh, in a single day during June during my research. So my day could start with a drone flight at one site, and then I could go and scout and enter scouting observations into an iPad at the next site. And then two hours later, I may be in central Nebraska helping a farmer get his fertigation and irrigation system started uh, to execute research. Uh, I could be sending a prescription to a monitor in a, in a sprayer cab in eastern Nebraska and then also be coming home to work on code late at night. Uh, and I think this is something that a lot of people don't see when they think about agriculture uh, is, is that there's, you know, a lot of people view it as, you know, their grandfather's farm where there wasn't a lot of technology that was involved in the process. Um, but for me, you know, agriculture has been one of the most high tech spaces that uh, I've, I've been around. Um, and so all of these things are extremely exciting, but I think what's even more exciting is the purpose behind what we're doing. 
Um, and, and I think agriculture is one of the fields that allows us to most directly work with benefiting society as a whole, our environment, uh, and the, the incomes and livelihoods of a lot of people out there in the world. And so um, right there on the right are just three pictures that I think embody that, where you have farmers who are harvesting their crops and, and earning their livelihood for the year. You have uh, a river here in Nebraska that is being sustained by more sustainable management over the past 50 years. And you have people who are getting together to enjoy a meal that hopefully has been produced more sustainably as, as Luis has talked about. And you know, maybe it's a farm to table meal. And it's been enabled by better technology that allows growers to do that better. So that's, that's why agriculture for me. So if we could move to the next slide, please. So my particular research is on sensor-based fertigation management. Uh, and for those of you who don't know or haven't heard what fertigation is, that's okay. I'd never heard of it until I got out here myself. Um, but fertigation is the process of applying fertilizer through an irrigation system. Therefore, fert and irrigation combined together meets, makes fertigation. Um, and so the purpose of our research here is to try to more efficiently apply nitrogen fertilizers uh, to ultimately reduce the total amount of nitrogen fertilizers that are applied to produce a corn crop. Uh, and the benefits of that are reduced nitrate leaching to groundwater, which is a public health concern, uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions due to over applications of nitrogen fertilizers, um, and, and also increased grower profitability because they're using less nitrogen to produce essentially the same crop. And so the, the way that we go about creating these sensor-based fertigation management protocols as we capture imagery uh, each week using a drone. And this is multi-spectral imagery. And, and we take that and we put it into a computer program uh, that analyzes the imagery uh, and generates a nitrogen prescription. So that nitrogen prescription basically just says, this is how much fertilizer we want to apply, we want to apply and where we want to apply that fertilizer. And then ultimately the end of that process at the end of each week is to apply that nitrogen fertilizer as appropriate to get the crop where it needs to be. Um, and my stake within this, this research is twofold. So I, I have one component of my research that is working on the actual on-farm implementation uh, of this protocol. And so we've, we had five sites uh, in 2019 and five sites again in, here in 2020, uh, where we are actually implementing these on production scale farms. Uh, so that's been really interesting, but my other component is trying to automate this process and essentially create software that allows us to uh, close the loop on the entire process from image capture all the way to when that prescription is delivered to the pump. So that's an overview of my, my research. We can go to the next slide now. Uh, and this is in 2019, we saw really good results from the method that we're using right now. And just to summarize this graph, we saw very little change in yield, which is this, which are the center three bars across our, our, our treatments versus the growers' typical management. But we saw really large decreases in total nitrogen rate applied, um, up to 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre applied. Uh, we applied less fertilizer than the growers' typical management, which ultimately leads to higher efficiency and, and better environmental results for our growers and profit results. So we can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to put together a slide with just uh, a few challenges, both challenges to our project in particular, but also I think some of the grander challenges that we have in agriculture. Um, for my project in particular, process execution is probably the, the biggest challenge, uh, especially at scale. So imagery quality and capture is something that we run into a lot. Uh, high winds, clouds, and all of that, that sort of thing can really impact how good our images are, um, especially when we're capturing those with the drone. Um, and in Nebraska, that is especially true. So that's something we run into every day. Equipment function is also something that we, we run into and trying to get better rural connectivity uh, to the internet is something that we run into a lot where we can't communicate with our pumps over the internet because of the distribution. So um, those are two of the local challenges, but I think on a, on a broader scale, um, adoption of technologies as Osler's already mentioned and Luis has already mentioned um, can be a real challenge. And so, I think three of the big questions that we have to ask about adoption are, can technology demonstrate a return on investment for our farmers? Do these technologies actually work in practice? And do these technologies scale up? Uh, and, and to kind of highlight this, uh, I wanted to bring in um, what's called the hype curve uh, over on the right. So you have your technology trigger, your peak of inflated expectations, your trough of disillusionment, and ultimately to the plateau of productivity. It, a lot of times, I think a lot of technologies try to run before they can walk. 
Uh, and so I think we have to be very intentional in technology about how we go about scaling our technologies and, and making sure that we are slowly scaling the technologies up uh, to achieve that plateau of productivity in a, in a more straight line fashion that is more beneficial to everyone. Um, Integrated precision agronomy and engineering. Essentially, our agronomists need to talk to our engineers a lot more frequently and make sure that our machines are matching up with what we're expecting them to do. Um, and transition management, I think, is also a, a big key as we are trying to push towards sustainable agriculture. Farmers need to, to be given a, a direct vision and a pathway to what sustainable agriculture is. Because unless they're, they're offered a how, it's really hard to get to the what because they already have the why, but we have to provide a how for farmers to get to that sustainable agriculture practice in a way that's going to benefit them uh, and make sure that they maintain profit. So if we could go to the next slide, that's the very last one. Um, so some opportunities that I think are, are out there uh, for my particular research in particular, fertigation practices are becoming commonplace. Uh, about 25% of irrigated corn production uh, across the U.S., actually, uh, those acres are fertigated acres, uh, which is 4% more total acres in 2018 than in 2013. So nationwide, fertigation is becoming more popular as a nitrogen management practice, which is great to see. Um, overall, I think farmers really do want to improve nitrogen use efficiency. From my conversations with them, as well as the data that we've seen, farmers really do want to become more sustainable. They just want to do it in a way that is also going to lead to a return on investment for their farm. Um, and as you can see in the chart there at the bottom, between 1990 and 2010, farmers in the state of Nebraska increased their efficiency uh, basically by 40% in terms of nitrogen, which is pretty incredible. And, and so they, they clearly want to do this. We just have to give them the technologies and show the return that will allow them to do it. Um, adoption, I, I think we can address a lot of this with next generation farmers who are more well-versed in technology. Uh, I think we can address it through NRD and NRCS cost share programs, which are doing a great job of getting technology in the hands of farmers uh, directly and, and helping them to afford it. Um, product cost reduction is another big key, which I think is, is going to happen naturally as these technologies mature. Uh, and, and realizing value on the farm. We have to demonstrate to farmers through on-farm research, uh, through a lot of practical implementations, production scale implementations of these technologies that there is value to be realized out there. Um, and as Osler mentioned, uh, and Luis have already mentioned, cross-disciplinary collaboration is so key. Partnerships, uh, understanding these, these variety of disciplines that have to come together in agriculture because it is such a dynamic and multifaceted industry. Uh, I think those cross-disciplinary collaborations are critical. And so with that, I wanna pass it over to Jody uh, so she can share a little bit about her research. Um, hello to everybody. I am honored to be a part of this webinar and I am very impressed with the young people who have joined us today. They have done some amazing things at such a, a young stage in their life. Um, my name is Jody Delosier and I am a third year PhD student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the School of Natural Resources. Um, I have a different sort of background. I'm gonna come about this from more of a stakeholder engagement perspective. I have 15 to 20 years of teaching experience in uh, German. And when my kids um, moved out of the house, I decided to go back to school and I was very interested in um, environmental issues and uh, decided to obtain my master's degree in natural resource sciences with a specialization in human dimensions. Human dimensions looks at how people interact with the environment, how, um, how they impact it, and um, during my time as a master's student, I became in really interested in water and agricultural issues because I was a graduate assistant for the Nebraska Water Leaders Academy. Uh, the academy is a year-long program made up of individuals from across the, straight, across the state from uh, different geographical areas, and they're interested in learning more about Nebraska's water and ag issues. These are professionals from uh, representing various stages of their careers, uh, both men and women, joining us with a lot of uh, diversity and experience. Um, in 2018, I continued my education and um, I am currently involved in the Water for Agricultural project. This is a national project funded by the US um, Department of Agriculture. It's a tri-state grant. And the purpose of this project is to bring together a variety of stakeholders to help foster community-led solutions to 
those water and ag issues that mean most to them. So what we are really interested in is community capacity building. How can communities not only identify their water and ag concerns, but solve those problems? Our work can be found in five communities located in Nebraska, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. And I am currently involved in the Central Platte River region. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk about the challenges that women may encounter when they're trying to become engaged or more knowledgeable about water and agricultural issues. Um, Louise kind of uh, suggested this, that agriculture is traditionally a male dominated field. And, and the same can be true here in Nebraska. Um, on the Water for Ag project, our, one of our um, objectives was to um, start up a local leadership team made up of stakeholders representing the Central Platte River region. And we, we wanted to uh, bring on board a, a diverse group of individuals representing different um, organizations. We definitely wanted ag producers and we wanted uh, gender diversity, uh, different ethnicity, cultures. And in Central Nebraska, that can be a challenge. Um, trying to locate um, women landowners uh, was definitely a challenge. Um, and even though more and more women are owning farmland, um, oftentimes they lease out their fields and it makes it difficult to um, locate the landowner because it's being farmed by someone else. Um, in the end, on our uh, local leadership team, we had one woman um, who represented, uh, she was the mayor of a local community. So that, so that was really a, a challenge from our end. Um, we also need to recognize that women's preferences for outreach and education may be different than men's. People learn differently, and there are some definite gender differences when it comes to learning, um, even in agriculture. Uh, the research on women's land, women landowners does support the idea that women have a need for more peer-to-peer -peer learning. They want to belong to a network. Uh, they want basic information on agriculture because many of them don't have the background. They want to know about emerging ag technology, sustainable farming practices, how they, be, they can be more resilient with their farm practices, and financial resources. Where can they get grant money? How do they even uh, fill out the paperwork? Um, so we need to kind of take that into account. And um, lastly, there is a lack of a support system made up of other women landowners who want to interact with other women landowners. Next slide, please. Now that we know what the, some of the challenges are, how can we support women and young people in these areas? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we can do in Nebraska. Locally, we want to definitely encourage more involvement by women and young people in the Nebraska Water Leaders Academy. That's something we definitely need to do. Uh, we also need to provide more opportunities for social learning. Women interested in agriculture and water management want opportunities to connect with other women, other young people in order to ask questions, network and share knowledge. So how can this happen? Well, attending workshops and conferences about water and agriculture. In Nebraska, we have the Women in Ag Conference every year. They bring together lots of leaders. There are many women who own farmland. They want to, they come together to learn about a lot of different topics. Um, in 2019, Nebraska Innovation Campus hosted Women Managing Agricultural Land Conference. And this was attended by over 300 landowners, farmers and ranchers, and industry professionals looking to increase their business management skills. So you can tell by, by these attendance numbers, there is a need. Um, for those of you who are um, socially savvy, you can get on ag chat on Twitter. And so you can uh, meet other people in different parts of the, the world. Also learning circles. This is something found across the country. These are peer directed facilitated learning experiences that provide women landovers with support, education and networking. And it's a place where they can go to feel comfortable to ask questions. Um, uh, no intimidation factor here. And um, it, it's really been a successful um, movement. There are opportunities for involvement in water and agriculture, but it takes some legwork. Um, I would encourage young people and women to seek out internships, volunteer opportunities with government agencies, non and for profit organizations. For example, here in Nebraska, we have the University Extension, Nebraska Water Center, DWFI, Department of Natural Resources, and there, there are numerous ones, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Groundwater Foundation, 
um, get online and you can you can find these um, organizations. Um, with the Water for Ag project, we want to provide tools to help identify and solve those water and ag issues that impact women's farm practices and their business. And that's what we're going to, um, that's the, one of our objectives is to have some sort of toolkit or guidebook um, that helps um, these communities uh, really um, uh, find a way to um, solve their own community problems. Uh, we also need institutional change. Government agencies should consider producing information materials geared toward women landowners and improve their outreach programs. Um, we need to remember that women use technology different, um, use social, some of them use social media, some do not. Uh, there are many older women who um, own farmland or who own land and lease their properties out. And lastly, we need up-to-date farmland ownership demographics in order to identify women landowners. Um, the most recent national survey of farmland ownership was done in 2014. That's the USD Census of Ag. And um, the next one isn't until 2022. So it's really a challenge um, if, we're, if we're wanting to um, get these women on the radar so that they can participate in water and ag policy making. Um, although there are challenges, I believe that Nebraska and the Midwest, we are really moving forward to try and address some of these um, inequities. Thank you. Back to you, Molly. Thank you, Jody. And also thank you, Jackson. Thank you, Osler. Um, I got a lot out of all three of those presentations. Thank you very much for sharing about your backgrounds as well as your research and as well as resources for everyone um, to take advantage of. But now it's time to hear from our attendees. Thank you so much for all of the great questions. Uh, obviously, we won't be able to get to all of them today, but we'll get to as many as we can. And for those that we can't, we will be posting all of the questions on um, DWFI's YouTube channel. So we'll send you a link to the video following the webinar in a day or two. And you can use that, um, that forum, really, that's, that's for the YouTube channel to ask more questions or even provide answers yourself. So this is a way that we can keep the conversation going. But for our first question, I have a question for Louise. During your cacao project, which I understand is still going, what was the most frustrating challenge or experience you had and how did you overcome it? Ah, with the cacao project, well, there's quite a couple, but one of them I would say is, uh, you know, like the stereotypes and, and the, the, the kind of the difficulty it is to gain credibility as a young woman. So I've always been a staunch advocate of, you know, making agriculture cool again. And I would show up with like makeup, red lipstick, these really designer wellies that I tried to make um, at farms and people would be like, why would I listen to this girl? And so it's, it's kind of really difficult to deal with culture, ageism, and all of these things, because it's, it's hard to have credibility on farms. And people will kind of think, oh, you know, I've got to take care of you. You're such a precious, like, you're like a crystal. We can't, we can't make you go out in the sun because you'll get darker skin. And it's kind of combating those ideas and showing that, you know, young girls and young women can definitely be in agriculture. And we're, we're ta we take it seriously. And we're going to do that. We're here for the long haul. It's something that we take seriously as a, a noble career choice. That's Awesome, and I'd love to see your designer wellies. <laughs> um, I have a question here for Jody. Um, the reason behind focusing on women landowners only, uh, which I think the, the focus behind that is, um, you know, in, in Nebraska's case, how, how do women get into agriculture? How can we support them? Uh, well, ways? That's a really good question because it can be challenging. Um, I do think there are women out there who are willing to mentor other women. And um, I think it's just a matter of, of reaching out. And um, I think a lot of times there is some, an intimidation factor that uh, as Louise said, women don't belong in agriculture. And they, we definitely do. And so there has to be kind of an internal shift in how we as women view ourselves in agriculture. Um, you know, I can only speak for Nebraska 
but um, I do feel like there are a lot of um, places that women can go to get assistance, um, talk to somebody about it. I think, you know, um, just not being intimidated is, is critical. And one thing that I did coming into natural resources from, a, it was completely different for me and not having a network, even though I am from Nebraska, is I just, I went to conferences that dealt with water issues, agricultural issues, met people, and I followed up with a phone call later and asked them if we could just sit down, or in this case, could I have a Zoom meeting with you? Can we do an informational interview for 30 minutes? And, and that really puts them at ease because you're not looking for a job. You're not asking them um, hard questions. It's just, you know, let's just talk about how you got to where you're at, or, you know, is there somebody else I need to talk to? This comes down to that, um, uh, that communication aspect of, of and collaborating and, and women supporting women. That's a great answer, Jody. I'm so glad that you mentioned informational interviews. I do think that that's a wonderful way for people to get a foot in the door, learn more about the area um, that they're interested in and build their network. That's how you build a relationship. Thank you, that's super. Um, I have a question for Jackson. How, how is fertigation related to sustainability? Is, is fertigation something that um, can help improve resiliency and sustainability in agriculture? Sure, so, so generally speaking, fertilizer is absolutely critical for maintaining high yields. Like it, it's, it's very much so a part of the crop production process. I think we can get away from fertilizer. I think you can have a discussion about what the most sustainable forms of fertilizer are. Um, but I don't think we're ever going to get away from it. And, and managing fertilizer correctly is absolutely critical to sustainability. And so within our irrigated systems, one of the, the things that we've, well, I guess generally about with, with corn and a lot of nitrogen intensive crops, one of the things that we know is that their nitrogen uptake is the highest toward the middle and later parts of the season. But yet that is out of sync with a lot of our nitrogen application practices that are commonplace in agriculture. And so fertigation contributes to sustainability in the sense that fertigation can be executed all the way through the reproductive growth stages of the corn plant, which are at the very end of the season toward the tail end of its nitrogen uptake. And so if we can use fertigation to distribute our, our nitrogen applications across the course of the growing season for when the plant most needs that nitrogen, that, that, is, that is one of the best things that we can possibly do because we can limit the total amount we need and make sure it's there at the right time, which ultimately is, is the big question for sustaining yields. And so, yes, if, I mean, fertigation is, is designed to be a sustainable practice and, and using quantitative ways of managing it uh, is, is kind of the next step in that sustainability and making sure that we're doing it the right way. Great answer. Thank you, Jackson. Osler, I have a question for you as well. I, I see there's been a lot of interest in your coffee farm, but this is actually related to your pathway, which has been through academia. How did you decide to get into, to go into graduate school? And if someone was interested in, in similarly taking that kind of path, what advice would you give them? So with my, thank you very much for the question. So with my background, and involvement in agriculture, having a college degree was a, was a great step, but however, by being exposed to the agricultural uh, practices, production systems, I figured that there were many things that needed improvement. And so going to a graduate school program will help me to go deeper in the understanding of our cropping systems and hopefully being able to understand better some of the things that we can do in order to improve agriculture regardless of, of, uh, of the crop. Like you see, I was uh, working with coffee, soybeans, corn, uh, all of the principles, I believe they are applicable uh, to uh, plants and crops production in general. So trying to get a deeper understanding of crops production is what brought me to go further into grad school and um, it was a, just a great decision. Osler, thank you. Obviously, the, the focus of our webinar today is on ways we can support women and obviously young entrepreneurs. And we have two gentlemen on this 
panel. We have Jackson and Osler. Can I ask each of you, you know, why, why did you decide to participate in the webinar? And as men, you know, what are some ways that, that you can, that men in general can help support women be successful in agriculture? And whoever wants to go first. I am, uh, I am unmuted, so I can go ahead and start. Okay. So no, it was great whenever this opportunity was brought to my attention, I didn't think twice. I just looked at my calendar, it was open, and I said, yeah, why not? Uh, I believe uh, it is a time where we need to all work together. We need, uh, we need partnerships, we need collaboration, we need an involvement of a society. Society includes women, includes young people. So this is a great place to start. And like I showed in my slides previously, service, leadership, involvement are, are part of my priorities. So being here today and trying to share a little bit of my history and uh, also about my path to a school over here um, is, a, is a good opportunity to hopefully motivate uh, others to uh, get into the same type of uh, thinking and, and setting goals and trying to achieve those goals. Thank you, Osler. Back you, Jackson. Sure. So I guess, so when I was invited to the webinar, the first thing I did is I watched Luis's video that, that you all included as a, as a link. And I was really inspired by what she is doing uh, in her work. And so I was like, absolutely, I want to participate in this. And I guess, you know, understanding my perspective on women in agriculture, I've been very fortunate to be highly impacted uh, by two women who are, uh, I believe, very, uh, they have a lot of expertise in agriculture. One of those is Laura Thompson, who is the director or co-coordinator of the Nebraska On-Farm Research Network, who is, she has basically given me every opportunity that I've had in ag tech uh, and, and brought me to the University of Nebraska in the first place. And so she's had a huge impact on me. And I work with a fellow graduate student um, who, is a woman in ag who I believe is, is probably one of the sharpest agronomists that I've been around um, and is making a, a huge impact on farmers every day. Um, and, but, you know, even with having these, these women in, in positions of uh, a lot of success within agriculture and a lot of, um, you know, power control, they still face, you know, some, some levels of, of challenge. Uh, you know, like Sam, who's my fellow graduate student, she's spoken a few times about, you know, even on her farm, she's still not allowed to drive the planter or, or you know, so, and, and last year was that time she drove a combine and it was one of our cooperating growers who actually allowed her to get up in the combine and, and drive it around. So um, I think one of the big things that, that I see as men in agriculture that we can do is to just make sure that women are involved in, in every aspect of the industry. You know, it's not like there are just certain aspects of the industry that, that women can execute. You know, it's not like they, they can't handle driving agriculture equipment. They, you know, they can't, you know, go and do the field data collection. I, I think involvement is, is key. And I think it's especially key for young women in agriculture, right? Because if they can see all the opportunities that are available and, and maybe young women are, are gonna be inspired by the tech that's available to them in agriculture, you know, if they can see that from a young age and be involved from a young age, I think it would just encourage, you know, that, that growth throughout their life. Um, and I, I was really encouraged to see one of my farmers actually in the video that I had on my slide, he brought his daughter out there with him to the, to the field. And I guess they were going out for the day to run gravity irrigation lines. And she was sitting there basically watching us work on this new variable rate fertigation pump. And, you know, I, I just, I thought it was great that she was already involved at the farm at an age of four, you know, and I, I hope that. So, um, Anyway, that's, I guess, my perspective. Jackson, thank you very much. Thank you both. That's, um, I really appreciate the, your perspective. I would love to drive a combine. <laughs> Who wouldn't? I mean, that would just be awesome. Um, you know, we've had just exceptional speakers today. Obviously, we are start with Louise, Osler, Jackson, and Jody. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. And you'll also find more information on the Institute, the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute on our website, which is waterforfood.nebraska.edu. And I sure hope you'll connect with us through Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. We're all over. We want to continue this conversation. Um, I think it's not only been incredibly informative today, but a lot of fun. So I thank all of you for your involvement. Thank you so much panelists and participants for joining us. 
and I sure hope to see you next week. Thank you.